Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. Today, we interview one of my longtime friends and mentors, one of the greatest physiques to ever walk the face of the planet, a man who's competed in 77 professional shows, 110 in total, literally maybe the most aesthetically pleasing physique ever to walk the earth as well as certainly, without question, the hardest working athlete I've ever worked with in the gym. We did some of the absolute craziest things you ever heard of in the gym and built insane amounts of muscle in a short period of time. Milos the Mind Sharchev joins me today to talk about his training methods, who it applies for, and really why you want to start considering training in this different way. And really, I did this for a long time, and I think it's really, really beneficial. I also obviously play devil's advocate a little bit with Milos and talk about other types of training and really how complementary my training and his training would be. He also gets into how he was able to get in literally perfect condition in 77 professional contests. There was never a show where this man wasn't in perfect condition. If you don't already follow him on social media, you'll see that in every one of his pictures, not only on stage, but in his photo shoots. He was absolutely inside out shredded. And this is not, you know, by today's standards, this is by world class, any day standards, one of the most lean, beautiful physiques you've ever seen in your life. And he gives us a lot of insights into how exactly he did that and how his unique approach should be modeled today, but really isn't. And why people today maybe don't have the same level of muscularity and conditioning that he did back in his day. Absolute wealth of information is Milos and so grateful to not only have him on the show today, but also be able to travel the world with him over the next four weeks as we go to Dubai at the end of January 2020 and then over to Sydney, Australia at Kingdom Gym and over to Melbourne, Australia at Doherty's and then over to Bali at Body Factory over the next four weeks throughout January and February. If you guys want more information about that, do not hesitate. It may be sold out by the time this launches, but musclecamps.com is the place to go to find camps in Australia and Bali. If you're in Dubai or want to travel to Dubai, dubaimusclecamp.com is where you can find information about that. So we're doing a format that allows the greatest number of people to come, which is a one-day seminar which is just seminar. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about building extreme amounts of muscle and getting an extremely great condition. It's a one-day event anyone can attend. It's not for any particular level of intellect or experience. It's just we're going to give you something to take your results to the next level. I guarantee there will be something in there that will completely blow your mind and change your paradigm and expedite your process. And then there's also a four-day camp offer, which is including that one day and three additional days. And then those three additional days will be two workouts a day. One is going to be muscle intelligence style. One is going to be meal style, both of which have massive benefit. And you can learn both styles to apply to your training going forward to expedite your progress and results. I look forward to seeing every one of you there. We truly aim to make it a world-class experience. And, you know, I have no doubt in my mind that Milos is going to do nothing short of that. And people are asking how it will be different than my camps in the past with Jordan or maybe at the gym. And the reality is I want to teach everything other than muscle building this time. You know, people still want to learn some execution stuff. And obviously, I still will talk about muscle building a lot. But the thing that I have to offer that may be a little bit unique is this perspective on the six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular physique. So what are they? how they work, how you can use them to get your greatest results. So most people myopically focus on one piece, right? They'll focus on training or a nutritionist will focus on nutrition or, you know, a doctor will focus on blood work or whatever it may be. I'm going to teach you how to integrate all those things and how to kind of look at the big picture and understand which one is most important. And then obviously how to apply it and get the greatest amount of progress and result based on your objectives. And, and so I'll be diving deep into everything that happens outside of the gym. And we'll also be diving into mechanisms of muscle building and his hyperemia training protocols and really working really, really hard. So without further rambling for me, I apologize for the long intro, but I thought it was important you guys have a bit of a pre-framing about this amazing man you're about to hear from. This podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks. You can check them out, blueblocks.com for blue blockers that are actually stylish and look awesome. Blue Blocks is spelled B L U. BLOX.com slash muscle intelligence will get you 15% off your order with Blue Blocks. You can also use the code muscle at blueblocks.com. As you've heard us talk about in the past, Blue Blocks are definitely our go to choice for blue blockers, both aesthetically 
and also functionally. These are amazing, amazing glasses. I have my kids wearing them every evening if they decide to get in front of a screen or watch television or if we're even driving in the car, that light is going to massively impact your circadian biology and prevent you from getting deep sleep. If you want to learn more about that, we talk a lot about that on the podcast I did with Dr. Huberman. And without further ado, I hope you love this podcast with Mila Sarchev. If you did, listen all the way to the end and show at least one person you know and love. Have a great day. I'm sitting here, well, on the other side of the continent with my great friend, Milos Sarchev. Uh, super excited to talk about you, buddy. And this is the first time on the podcast, which is surprising because I speak about you often and you're one of my greatest mentors and role models in the sport. One of the guys who I looked up to from day one for me and Milos, I'm super honored to have you here joining me on my show. Thank you. And I'm honored to be here. I listen to your podcast. As I told you, I follow you for many years and I've seen it developed in absolute genius. So actually, in the last couple of years, I've been learning something from you directly. And to be on your podcast with all the great guests that you have so far, you know, I'm honored myself. Yeah, you were the physique that I wanted to emulate most, Milos. I often, you know, see you see me posting about you on social and it's like, man, this is to me is ultimate perfection. It's, you know, people say this, we wish bodybuilding went in this direction. And, and I don't think people understand what went into building your physique. And after having met you, I get it. I see it. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, bodybuilding went in the wrong direction. And I don't think that's the case. I think that bodybuilding just hasn't seen someone as neurotically obsessed as you were with building your body. And that's not an insult. That's certainly a compliment. And I think that's what's necessary to achieve the level of greatness you did. And not only the level of greatness, but the frequency with which you repeated it and consistency with which you repeated it, in my eyes, has never been replicated yet. It's just the number of shows you did and the condition you brought and how to, uh, you're full and, and big and it was always in shape and your posing was perfect. And people think that stuff happens by accident. But after having spent a good amount of time with you late 2010, early 2011, I see just what went into that, man. And that you literally shaped so much of my career following that buddy that I have to extend a vote of gratitude to you. And I really want to talk about that, right? Like where that neurotic obsession came from and, you know, how that manifested in you becoming this incredible bodybuilder. Yeah. So I remember that 2010 when we trained for that flex show, right? That's right. Yeah. It was a wonderful experience. And then as you remember coming to your place and teaching and posing and every little angle, little inch here, inch there, external rotation, internal rotation, angling positioning would matter i didn't say this uh, officially yet but yeah uh, thank you so much for putting me always on pedestal and saying that my physique is one of the best because i was in the 90s not considered really a top contender three times in my life i placed stand at olympia so a lot of people don't see this as a, any major accomplishment but when you see that there was a lineup of flex and sean and Kevin and the Dirk. greatest bodybuilders of all time yes you know so people don't understand when 10 great guys are competing somebody has to be first and somebody has to be last yep. and uh, ronnie coleman was 1997 ninth place i finished 10th and following year he won but yeah uh, thank you very much for considering my physique as one of the best i always think that bodybuilding is about shape aesthetics and let me first say this just like man's physique, when we talk about it, I, I had this many times. People are, oh, you bodybuilders, you muscular guys, you know, like, hold on a second. What, you don't want to be muscular? Like, you want to tell me that any man on this earth, when they can choose to get a body to be skinny, fat, or muscular, they're going to choose anything but muscular. Right. right. So it's, it's a bullshit right there. Excuse my language. And the same thing with the ladies, like, oh, we don't like muscular physique. So <laughs> whether you like a slab of fat or, or, you know, bony guy, or you like certain kind of muscle. Now, you don't have to be professional level bodybuilders, you know, muscular, but, you know, just to have a nice athletic, aesthetic physique and in tone, that should be a goal for everyone. When I came into sport, I idolized Frank Zen, Serge Nubre. I mean, guys that were just really, I think, in my opinion, flawless. I mean, that, that's the shape, that's the uh, physique that anybody in the world, when they see the, the physique, that they would want to emulate. So yeah. this is my guidance. And I think I achieved that like mid-90s, like uh, 97 especially. That was, I think, my best year the, when I was most comfortable with my look. But still, I could not crack the top six at Olympia. So 
by 99, I, I tried to put more size. And at Olympia, I didn't really make a top six, but in a European Grand Prix Tour right after, I managed to beat Nasser and Marcus and you know many guys that I wouldn't beat normally. Man, so people see your physique and they assume, hey, he has great genetics, or they assume, hey, you know, whatever they want to assume. But and myself included, right? When I first heard about you, I heard about you through, you know, our, our mutual friend, Bob Weatherall. And, and I said, you know, who's this guy? And I want to hear about you. And, and you don't really comprehend what goes into building your physique, buddy. And then when I got the opportunity to spend that time with you, I had no comprehension of the amount of detail that you put into absolutely everything. And I think this message needs to be emphasized for our listeners and for people who aspire to greatness in anything in their life. It's not just bodybuilding, but this, you know, attention to detail and the adherence to the minutia was unbelievable, you know, from this reality that you took detailed notes of everything that went into your body, every workout you did, and this is including food and supplements and activities and, and extracurricular activities and everything you did. And I want you to talk about that, man, like where that habit started and what details you went to really bring the condition you did. Okay, 1987, I started my journals, and I had them until 2003. Every single meal, like I said, every a milligram of any vitamin I took and other things that we take, as you know, every gram of carbohydrates, protein, fats, calories, everything was meticulously calculated, and I had a plan for the next day and the next week and the next month. Now, a lot of times people consider just like, oh, bodybuilding is hard because of uh, training. And I did train in average 550 times a year, which is if you calculate like 11 workouts a week, you know, so I pretty much train twice every day consistently throughout the whole year for 15 years straight. But that was the easy part. The hard part was eight meals a day plus supplementation. And a lot of times now I, and I work with some people and even top pros, they have one, you know, competing this year, this year at Arnold Classic. He's just a fabulous bodybuilder, but oh, he doesn't have an appetite and he doesn't want to eat. I say, excuse me, you're a pro bodybuilder. If you want to maximize something, if you want to win every aspect, maximal stimulation, maximal nutrition, maximal recovery, maximal everything that goes into the equation of you know, building the greatest physique has to be accounted. I mean, I know that you go a little bit further now with the meditation and breathing and uh, other things that I didn't consider really back in uh, my time. Now, of course, everything makes sense when I'm hearing it from you. But I tell you this, I had a two bad days within a year that I would put in my calendar, in my notebooks, and I would make uh, you know, specific notes that, okay, I had a two bad days out of 365. So as long as I do everything that I'm supposed to do, and I check good day, good week, good month, I know I'm progressing. So one thing that I did that nobody did back in my time, I competed in every organized show. I mean, every show that the organizer competed. And I took this back in the time as it's opportunity to improve, to work, to make money, to be seen. You know, so it is just like if you have a nine to five job and you decide Monday I'm going to work, Tuesday and Wednesday I'm going to skip. Okay, I'm going to show up on Thursday. No, there was an IBB Pro show and I could enter it. There was no way on earth I would pass. The only reason that a few years I passed some of the shows is because I actually organized appearances in Europe and Australia and in Asia. So I would actually make more money traveling like this and, and doing appearances than competing. Because as you know, mid 90s, they start judging physique mostly on the size because Dorian started a trend. And then, of course, I realized I have no chance of maybe cracking the top five. So instead of not making any money, as you know, the pro bodybuilding shows don't pay anything after the top five position. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why I, I chose not to compete in some of the shows, but I did 72 pro shows and I did uh, 110 shows in my life total. 
Absolutely unbelievable. And I remember coming into your home in 2010 when you still had all those journals. I know they no longer exist, but you still had all those journals and you gave me the opportunity to look through some. And the attention to detail just blew my mind. And I'll give specific examples on the podcast, but I talk about them sometimes. And I'm sure we will in the camps that we do together in Australia and Dubai and Bali. Like some of the stuff that I saw was just unbelievable. And for me, as this young, at the time, young, you know, kind of up and coming bodybuilder, it really just gave me perspective on all the things things that I wasn't doing that I could be doing to be better. And, you know, that's really where my respect and admiration for you grew to this exponential level. Because as you said in the beginning, like when you put me through posing, I had never realized that posing was that. I thought it was, hey, just go up there and flex a little bit and have fun. But the the attention to detail was just tremendous. And, And it's not something that anyone who hasn't competed in 110 shows would ever understand. It's not something that anyone who hasn't, you know, done meticulous journaling would ever understand. And, you know, the level of detail was, you know, like I say, there's nobody out there in my eyes, maybe Dorian, because Dorian brags about his journals being like this as well, but nobody else has done this. And so talk to me about, you know, what were the things that you were putting into your journals? So obviously we, you say you're putting all your daily nutrition plans. What do those look like? Like how many calories, how many carbs? And you, know, you could be as specific or, or general as you want, but you know, I'm very curious to like where you, I'm sure everyone wants to know, like how high were your calories and how much was your protein and what was your best growth, you know, diet and best workouts and get into that kind of stuff for me. Well, I'm going to probably piss off some people when I start talking about my protein intake, but this is true, honest, and you saw it back in the day. I have never went under 450 grams of protein daily, <laughs> and I was shooting for 550 each and every day for 15 years straight. Okay, so it's tremendous amount of protein. Yeah, it's like, you know, four grams of protein per kilo plus. And a lot of people are going to dispute that. You don't need that much. But let me tell you, when I didn't take as much protein, I simply didn't grow that much. And another guy, you know very well, that was Nasser al Sambari. In 1994, after the Olympia, he was in San Diego as my guest. And, you know, my journals were actually there on the table. You may, maybe heard that story. And he said, what is this? I said, that's my journal. And then he opened it and looked. I said, what? You're taking 550 grams of protein a day? I said, yeah, Nasser. As, as a matter of fact, don't you remember last year at FIBO when you and I talked and you asked me all these questions and for two hours I told you every little detail what to do to, you know, I, yes, I used insulin, I used so much carbs and <laughs> all this, I think, but this much protein was mandatory. And then he looked at his wife at the time and they to speak something German. And then she told me, but yeah, Milos, you know, Nasser did exactly the opposite, you know, because he actually didn't believe that I would tell him the truth. But one of the things that from that day, you know, okay, if you're doing 550, he's going to do 600 grams. And he went to public and that, that he was, you know, right uh, 95, started eating 600 grams of protein daily. I had you know, a few clients, of course, in my life that actually exceeded what I was taking, and they tremendously improved muscle size. Now, of course, I consider back in the day listening to Lee Haney's seminar in 1988, Flex Wheeler and myself, after competing at California State Championship, we went to his seminar, and he was you know, speaking openly. And Flex and I were the only two guys asking him questions constantly, so he was laughing. Of course, at the time, he didn't know who we were, but he actually had like only like 250 grams of protein daily. And I know some other champions that they would not go so high with protein, but I would challenge them if they did, okay, what would happen? And I'm convinced that if you keep everything the same, but you just increase the protein intake, you would see instant difference. So there's some things to think, consider about that, right? So looking at what I did, it's kind of common now for people to do two grams per pound. So that's not too much over what you were doing. And there's also genetic considerations, right? So there's some guys out there, I'm not going to drop names, but there's some guys out there who don't eat or they eat two meals a day. And these are pro bodybuilders and they maintain all their muscles. So there's certainly a genetic component of like this protein turnover ratio, like protein breakdown. Some people break down protein faster. Some people break down slower. And there's also the consideration of like digestion. Like, can you actually break this down? And obviously you had very healthy digestion. Because if, if an average person ate two grams of protein per pound, 
their stomach would look like a balloon. And, and that happens, right? Like that's ultimately what happens with a lot of body goes your stomach grows because it's just always full of protein. And eventually your body can't produce enough acid to break it down. So there's some considerations there, but certainly now we know enough to go, oh, well, you're eating this much protein, you can support it. Yeah. But there's definitely nothing wrong with it inherently, right? People think, oh, your kidneys, there's nothing wrong with eating that much protein. Yeah, I said this in many seminars before that because some doctor would be there and raise hand, excuse me, you know, don't you realize that uh, so much uh, protein would be toxic to your renal system and all that stuff. And I challenged them, okay, can you please find me a one study that is done on a healthy kidney, on a healthy individual, what would be toxic amount of protein? But yeah, uh, I completely agree with you. Genetically, we're all different and digestion is a huge thing. And throughout the years, actually, because of the digestion, I, you know, start changing and implementing a lot of essential amino acids instead of actually protein or reducing the protein size per meal and replacing with some essential aminos. And that's what the protein, the amino acids were like the size of your fist too, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Big ones. Yes. But, you know, speaking about this, really, I don't know if we mentioned this ever, I consider essential amino acids to be by far most important number one supplement, not for bodybuilders, but for humans. I mean, now there is all this vegetarian trend and you have a vegans and ovo-lacto, pescatarians, all different ones. Yeah, just add some essential amino acids to it and you'll have a pretty much, you know, you know, good diet. But yeah, I'm talking to you from the aspect I had eight meals a day and I had to have like my 60 grams of protein per meal minimum. And I did this religiously and I kept improving. And back in the time, the term of meals, but you don't really have an off-season I never consider off season because off is just like turn off word for me. Like, what does it mean? You know, now I'm going to yeah eat big to get big, eat whatever. No, we don't want to get big. We want to get muscular. We don't want to gain weight. We want to gain muscle. So for me, if you follow my career, I was adding quality muscle size from show to show. And sometimes there was just like two, three months between two shows. And I would show that bigger. Why? Because I kept my diet always strict. I increased the protein. And then carbohydrates, of course, I would have to manipulate. I was always a carb guy. I didn't go too much on ketogenic diet. Yes, I would absolutely agree. And I heard you as well. Ketogenic diet is by far the most effective diet to lose body fat. No question. But it's challenging to maximize hypertrophy for sure. competitive. Performance will suffer on a ketogenic diet. You'll lose fat. But so the consideration, Milosh, is, is I train with everybody, man. Mm -hmm. I, and nobody, nobody trains the way you do, buddy. Like the reason you needed that much protein, the reason you could handle that much carbohydrate is because of what you put yourself through in the gym, right? And, and you know, people could try wanting to do one of your workouts, but they can't produce the amount of cognitive mental effort and the amount of physical effort and output that you did in the gym. And, and that was what allowed your body to just upregulate metabolic functions and like synthesize twice as much protein because you're breaking down twice as much protein. Like you needed that. And I think, again, I know that I've yet to meet a bodybuilder who was anywhere near what you did. You know, maybe he did Tata, like you guys train together a lot, but yeah. nobody else. Okay. Well, you mentioned he did Tata, but now it's maybe a good moment to talk about this because I want to specifically say, all of us humans, we want to maximize everything. Anything we do, we want to maximize, don't we? I mean, if you're having fun, you want to have maximal fun. If you're making money, you want to, you know, make the maximum amount of money and on and on and on. But Kiratada came to my gym in 2006 and the sponsor hired me. And of course, we started training and immediately after a few weeks, he competed in the Sacramento show and placed 11th, which, you know, doesn't maybe uh, sound that great, but he beat some of the great guys even right there. And you know how in bulletin boards back in the day, there was no social media, but it was getbig.com. And there was a lot of people that were posting pictures. Ah, oh, he's Japanese. He's, you know, Asian and genetics. So he will never be at the Olympia and all that stuff. And I posted, and it's still there. You can read it. I said, he can be in Miss Olympia within a year. And that day, Ahira came to my gym and, and asked me, excuse me, why did you write this? I said, what do you mean? Oh, I can never be in Mr. Olympia. I said, Hira. Absolutely, positively, you can. As a matter of fact, ask your sponsor if he's willing to give me $50,000 bonus if you qualify for 2007 Olympia. And to make long story short, yeah, he got the call. You know, they approved it. They said, oh, what do you mean? They said yes? Yeah. So now there was that moment for me to say, okay, I have to be, again, truly analytical and maximize every aspect of, okay, what is the maximum hypertrophy stimulus? What would be maximum nutrition for him? What would be 
you know, everything else. And I can map out. I had a fortune that he was there with me. I can train him. I can see him twice a day, you know, so it was very easy to monitor. And, you know, to, to conclude, yeah, he qualified for 2007 Olympia. I made my bonus. And he is by now 10 times Olympian, three times IBB champion and stuff like that. So he made a great career. But uh, there was that, you know, first thing, he himself didn't believe it. Japanese people didn't believe it at the time. I say, hold on a second. Yeah, genetically, maybe, you know, we have uh, some people that are genetically gifted and predisposition for, you know, better protein synthesis and uh, greater growth. But we are all humans. There's no inferiority. If you're going to put the work, if you're going to find a way how to maximally stimulate your muscle, how maximum nutrition, maximum recovery, you can reach the stars. There is no way you would not. And speaking of that, back in 1987, I have that journal as well. I put on the cover, my five-year plan was, I'm going to come to the United States, I'm going to win Miss Universe, I'm going to qualify you know, to compete in Mr. Olympia, and I'm going to make a living off of bodybuilding within five years. I came 87, I won 89, I turned professional 91 and competed in 91 Olympia, and 92 I got the contract from Joe Wheeler. So I accomplished all the goals. Everybody that is listening, okay, they're listening to you that uh, competed at Olympia and, and, uh, and Arnold Classic, and uh, I believe you were second at Arnold, and you placed higher at Olympia also. And I think that if you had a longer career and if you wanted to pursue it, you could have been fighting for a title very easily, but you choose the pad that uh, you have now, and of course I commend you for it. But when we talk about this, and you know, every listener here, they need to know that everything is possible if you're going to honestly, truthfully put all your mind and soul and body into this. You're going to research, you're going to learn, you're going to analyze, you're going to challenge. That's one thing I heard from you, challenge everything, right? Sometimes you're going to hear some theory, some science, and they're going to tell you you have to do a certain way. Challenge it. Why? There is many, you know, ways to get to the Rome, right? You know, so, you know, find your own way. As Bruce Lee was saying, observe everything, see everything, accept what you find useful, discard what is useless, and create your own. So I created my own ways of hypertrophy, and you didn't hear that story, but my father, back in the time I was in Serbia and I started bodybuilding, challenged me. He told me, okay... Tell me what you know about exercise physiology. Tell me about what you know about hypertrophy and, you know, how the muscle grow. And, you know, so I said, okay, well, you know, you just go to the gym, you expose yourself to the intense weightlifting session, you create that mechanical tension, muscle damage, and all that stuff. You're going to deplete your glycogen and amino acids. You're going to create the micro of the muscle fibers. And then when you're resting, your body is going to replenish and recover. And this is how you grow. And he said, okay, but let me ask you this. Do you realize that only when you're physically active and when you're training, and now you're training what? Oh, muscles, and you do specific muscle body part, you're going to create increased blood flow to that muscle hyperemia. You're going to deliver now, if average man has like five and a half, six liters of blood, like 70% of that blood is going to go exactly through that muscle that you are firing, your muscle contractions, each and every rep, you are opening the cell and they're ready for uptake. You have a perfect opportunity to deliver what you want to deliver into that muscle only during the training. And I was saying like, hold on a second, you know, what are you trying to say? And he told me then uh, that example, like, okay, if I'm flying now airplane from Belgrade, Serbia, all the way to America, and there is no passenger, what is the point of flying? So he says, why would you deliver empty blood into your muscle when you're training? And again, I was a teenager at the time. I didn't want to listen to my father. He was super educated, most brilliant. and all. But, you know, teenagers usually always resist kind of you know, the parents. I said, what do you know yeah. about the bodybuilding, right? So I didn't want to listen to him. You know, but then within like three months, I didn't make like much of the gains. And then, you know, that curiosity, I said, okay, yeah. We had uh, essential amino acids in uh, Serbian pharmacies that I have to confess, 
I learned how to write in a Latin language. I stole the prescription from my father, and I wrote my essential amino acids prescription. You know, <laughs> on the twenty different uh, you know, pieces of paper, I went to twenty different pharmacies, and I got my essential aminos. And then, of course, dextrose is very readily available and cheap. So I would just you know start with the dextrose and essential aminos, and oh my god, you know, like I felt. Like I was on steroids. I mean, I was drug free at the time, of course. And my gains were like astonishing. Like, hold on a second, my father was right. And this is when I came up with this hyperemia advantage. I mean, I don't know if we can talk about this, but this, yeah. this is the theory that I honestly believe in it. It's not really my discovery. It's something that I got from my father. But I realize that every man that is listening, maybe this podcast right now, when you're not active, maybe 10, 12% of the blood is in your muscle. When you're training, 60, 70% goes into the exact muscle that you're training. Now, you can deliver that blood. And if you have a predigested nutrients, essential amino acids and ATP and glucose and whatever you put, betalanin, citrulline, L-carnitine, anything that you find useful, right? In elemental state, it's hydrolyzed, doesn't need a digestion. It is not take the blood out of the muscle and bring to the, your GI tract. You can insert all that in exact muscle cells of the muscle fibers you're training during a training. So that's that hyperemia advantage theory. And this is where I also, besides heavy duty training and typical mechanical tension and a stretch overload or muscle damage, I went for that metabolic stress type of training. Crazy pump, crazy pump, crazy pump. That's why I did a super set and three set and then giant sets and all kinds of things. But I would just overwhelm the muscle and push everything into it. And that was kind of something that I pioneered back in time. Nowadays, there is thousands of companies that have intra-workout uh, supplementation. Back uh, at the time that I was doing, there was uh, Charles Polikin that was suggesting uh, BCAAs. If you remember, intra workout, of course, you know, Charles is, God bless his soul, is also one of my mentors and one of the guys I looked up to. And by the way, you really start reminding me so much. On the, <laughs> you guys are Canadians, so maybe you have something in common. We have a good brilliance in you as much as Charles. Yeah, so brand chains were used at the time. And I remember back in 1995 when I did the first camp with Charles. We had a one disagreement, and that disagreement was about using a carbohydrates in the workout. He would use 200 grams of dextrose immediately after the workout, which first time when I heard that, it's like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. You know, but then I, I realized he would calculate how much glycogen you can burn during the workout, and he would actually recommend 200 grams of pure dextrose immediately after training back in 1995. Wow. This is how advanced he was. But I told him, of course, I would put this carbohydrates intra splitted, intra and post. He didn't agree, but uh, years later, he did make a post that yeah, he was wrong. As far as maximal hypertrophy, he would you know, see the point that I was making that carbohydrates intra workout would make sense. I know that sometimes you don't agree with that also, but there's uh, not, not necessarily true, man. I just don't, I think, so the only the only perspective I always give is many people, and I would say a large percentage of the population now lack focus. And if you take carbohydrates in at the beginning of the workout, your focus is going to deteriorate because your body's going to spike serotonin, right? So my suggestion for most people is to utilize the first 10 to 15 minutes of your workout, sometimes up to 20, to do something that's neurologically demanding, like the heavy, hard stuff yeah. to get your body kind of motivated and get your body releasing some dopamine, so that and acetylcholine, so that you can actually get focused and then do the, the carbohydrate. Because at that point, your pump is already there. You've already got the nervous system fired up. That would be the only separation that I may suggest. And that's so you, you tend to be very lean. You tend to be very, you know, probably insulin sensitive, where, you know, 80% of the population of the world is not. So that's the consideration that I would offer as maybe an asterisk. Yeah, and I don't disagree. I mean, this also makes sense. I do some, of course, heavy duty immediately in the beginning of the workout. But you see, my workout, if I would have a Hidetada or, you know, you name it, there was Dennis James, Dennis Wolf, Johnny Jackson, Sylvia Samuel, whoever would come in, they knew that the second they crossed that line, you know, from 
my juice bar into the gym. Now this is Colosseum. This is a ring and you're going to die trying uh, or let me kill you. Right. Well, Man, so I'm going to interrupt and, t- and tell the story of our first workout together. You probably don't remember this, but we were training back <laughs> first time in Coliseum. And I think I was like seven or eight exercises into my first set, puking in my mouth. <laughs> and you were standing three, maybe, I don't know, maybe 12 inches in front of my face and yelling at me to do more. And I'm literally puking in my mouth and, and trying to not throw up on you. And literally, I think we did 17 exercises or something like that on the first day. I was like, okay. And I don't know if you remember my friend Marco, who was also there. He said, I can't. Yeah, I remember, man. I remember it like it was yesterday. He's, he's like, I can't. And you, you stopped him and you pointed the door and you go, get the fuck out. <laughs> I was like, you're, and I loved it, man. Because you're, you're like, you're here to train. You can. And like, so I loved it, man. It was the most intense thing ever. I still tell the story. But so what you're saying, you're going into battle. It's not an exaggeration. Yeah, I mean, really. And now that you said, I mean, uh, I might look like an asshole, but if you're the coach, if you're a trainer, you want to get the most out of it. I mean, I kicked out Sirius Samuel twice. I actually had to grab him and walk him out because he was slowing down everybody else. Like, okay, if, you, if you're doing, you know, both the wall workout and uh, he day and then Dennis Wolf is, you know, dying, and then he comes to Syria and he's trying to fake. You can't fake experienced coach. I mean, you can, you can look at me and you, you know 100% if I'm faking or if I'm really, you know, going all out. So I know, I remember your face <laughs> very well, but I didn't know that I told it to, you know, him to get the fuck out if he doesn't want it. The same thing, actually, I did uh, say to Hida when he told me like, he can never qualify for Mr. Olympia. I said, okay, then there is a door. You know, you, you can leave now because if you don't believe it, I don't want to train you. And, you know, so they talk about training intensity, right? And I'm not saying... I mean, guys are so much stronger than me, and there is a lot of guys that have that crazy intensity. But I really, if I train you first time, like that was a perfect example. You're there first time. I didn't go easy on you. I didn't prepare you for it. I didn't give you like, okay, now we're going to warm up, and then we're going to next week we're going to increase it. I just bombed you. And this is what I do in the training camp as well. And now we're going to do the training camp in Dubai and Australia and Bali. Yep. Those people, I mean, they have to survive. I'm not going to go easy on anybody. Okay. I want to just show them how far you can push your body. And now after you finish this and then you consider what you just did, then reevaluate your training. Are you really training hard enough? Because if you do want to maximize everything, and we all do, then you have to be truthful to yourself. Are you pushing it to the limits? Yeah. So let, let's let's bring this back and talk a little bit about like the amount of carbohydrates around the yeah. workout. So we're trying to optimize hyperemia. How much carbohydrate should the average person be taking in intra, post, and throughout the entire day? Like how much of an adjustment do you recommend? Assuming that they're doing intense workouts, which, you know, that's a pretty big assumption because most people do not, as you yeah. know, but most people say, oh, I work hard and it's, you know, usually comically not hard. So what would you suggest and what was the highest amount you ever got intra and post? What I intra workout did was 100. And some people would question can you really process that much carbohydrates in a period of 60 minutes? And there are some science that you can do like so many grams per minute and stuff like that. Like Charles would say, if you can actually deplete 200 grams of glycogen during the workout, what does it mean? It's 200 grams of worth of carbohydrate source of energy, right? So you can maintain the glucose by outside glucose, you know, the carbohydrate choice that you're taking, or you're going to deplete your uh, muscle glycogen storage. So if it's uh, really 200, can you replace with 100? Yes. For my pro bodybuilders, if I would take you to the workout that I took you, you know, at that time, yeah, you would have 100 gram of carbohydrates capacity to take during this workout. Would I necessarily give you right away? Probably not. I would start to probably with 50. And 50 is a very good amount of carbohydrates to be taken throughout one workout session. Some people would say it's too much, but again, think what fuel are you using? Muscle contraction always is glucose, okay? How many repetitions are you going to do? Well, how many hundreds of pounds or tons, actually, of weight you are going to be lifting? How much is your work output? How much energy are you going to be burning? Can you actually have that much carbohydrates? So I tell you, I started like this with the 30 and then increased to 50, and then I realized I can do 75 and up to 100, especially uh, big body parts and, and body parts that you can see swelling, like chest, right? <laughs> shoulders. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially your shoulders. I mean, 
somebody made a comment of the poster. They made, Your shoulders way bigger than my head, and my head is huge. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like, I'm sure that in a shoulder workout, your dad's like just look stupid. My chest would be dramatically different in the workout or like uh, just like on an everyday basis. So I would push like up to 100 grams of carbohydrates during the workout, obviously with all my EAAs and BCAAs in the workout. Right. So what I was doing when, when I was training with you, we only, I think we did about three or four weeks of total workouts. And, and I did, on your advice, was 150 before, 150 during, and 150 after. Or maybe it was 100 after, actually. I think it was 150 before, 150 during, and 100 after, which is a lot of carbohydrates. So, I mean, that to me was extreme. But what I did notice that you were really great in advising was the osmolarity of the water. Like you always made sure there was a huge concentration of, of water. And I even added electrolytes. And I think that made a huge difference in pump and ability to perform the massive amount of work that we did. Okay, so I gave you 150. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. 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 So much. I mean, I was over 300 pounds at the time, right? So I was. I, was yeah, I mean, I, I think that you look fantastic and that the flag showed that you were overwhelmingly dwarfing everybody pretty much. I mean, the, the yeah. fullness that you had. I mean, you have that structure and then probably one of the best legs ever and that, you know, shoulder uh, width and the fullness. Then when you fill up your chest, I mean, you look like a contender that can be a uh, treble to anyone. You know, so... Kind of 50 carbs. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. But again, those workouts earned it, right? And I, I would I would test anybody to say like go through one of these workouts, you know, one day or subsequent days and see how much your appetite increases because it's massive and you can actually increase your calories a lot. And I think most people who are aspiring to build muscle out there need to hear all of these points you've just touched on is like, there's a lot of little things that you can be doing from, you know, how much you're sleeping, how often you're training, how many calories you're consuming, how much protein you're consuming, the amino acids, all the recovery aids that you're implementing that just went above and beyond everybody else. And that's why, I mean, listen, placing once or twice in the top show is great, but doing it for 77 shows over the span of 12 years is just unheard of, even by, I mean, short of Dexter, right, who's one of the most genetically blessed and hardest working guys that exist. You know, there's, there's nobody else that's done that, man. So there's definitely success leaves clues is something that I always believe, right? It is where their success follow closely. And you're certainly someone that everyone should aspire to. So you mentioned our camps coming up in Dubai and Australia and Bali, and those are all throughout February. And now what were the, what are the primary things you'll be teaching people? So if someone comes in and say, I don't want to be a professional bodybuilder. Is there anything that you're going to clue in on that you haven't discussed already? That would be something that would be a, a big, big takeaway for someone looking to optimize muscle growth and body composition. I mean, your teachings pretty much equivalent to mine. You go with the intelligent training principles, like apply everything that makes sense for muscle building. You know, so hypertrophy, there, there are many different ways. Like you said, metabolic, neuromuscular, neuro. What do you want to accomplish? What I said repeatedly maximizing. And by the way, I'm very glad that you, you mentioned if you use my type of training, you can definitely earn this 150 grams of carbohydrates. So if you are saying about maximizing, what I teach in, in uh, what we're going to teach in training camp, each and every person that shows up there, so what do you want to have? A minimal, optimal, or maximal results? Okay, if you want a maximal. So how are we going to accomplish this in a, in a training principles? Of course, First thing you're going to do in you know, most of that teachings, and I've seen your, your priming and execution mastery of each and every exercise, which a lot of people these days don't know how to train and don't know how to stimulate the muscle. So once they learn how to correctly execute and you know, have that time and attention and, uh, and feel the muscle and have that you know, full range of motion and have that stretch overload and then maximum shortening, <laughs> okay? And then you apply this in the intense training principles that I'm going to apply with, you know, some giant sets and different angle, different grip, different tempo, different variety of, of stimulation. And then maximize with the intra-workout supplementation and nutrition before, after training. You can, you know, maximize your results. One of the things that I do, my diets are not like long-term diets. My diet is a 24-hour diet. What does it mean? I would have three different possibilities of fat burning phase, 
maintenance phase and anabolic phase. That's the three phases in a day that you can use each and every day. If you know how to manipulate your carbohydrates, your activities, you do aerobic type of training that you're going to use fatty acids as a substrate, you're going to for sure burn it. That will be a fat burning phase. When you're going to apply it once a day or twice a day, you can each and every day make some fat burning guarantee. Then you're going to have a meals that are going to maintain according to a basic metabolism and your activities. You want to be on a protein and fat, ketogenic type of diet, no problem. You can be choosing those high protein and good fat meals until the moment of you're going to be preparing for your anabolic phase, which is always workout phase. So when we train, if you use my hyperemia advantage theory, you're going to push all these nutrients into the blood and you're going to do all this crazy muscle stimulation. You are able to turn all this uh, nutrition and shove it straight into the muscle fibers. So you can create anabolic phase and then uh, you can create hypertrophy. So these are the three phases that I do and I just maximize everything. So th this is one of the things that I specifically teach in these training camps and that's what we're going to touch in Dubai and Australia. Awesome, man. There's so much to be learned there. And, you know, one thing I want to kind of to touch on is anyone who wants to join us in Dubai or in Australia and Bali, I know you said you kind of don't want them to prepare, but I'm curious if anyone that signs up after listening to this podcast, would you be willing and agree to giving them a, you know, three week preparation workout so that they can come in and not get crushed? So like, Getting them, because I mean, I, I'd like to go, if I was doing this camp and you and I are going to be training together for three weeks, which is going to be great, I'm going to start preparing now. So would you make an agreement then that we send them a workout that works them up to getting ready so they, they ultimately they can make it through the workout and not pass out and actually be able to finish the sets? Is that something you think is reasonable or you just want people to just not prepare? Uh, we can do this by all means. If you want it, I'll do it gladly. But normally... Just like, did I prepare you when you came to the Colosseum gym that time? <laughs> but I was also a professional bodybuilder at the time. You're right. But most of these people are coming in are not at that yeah, level. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah, but so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is get everybody to the point where they have the aerobic conditioning, they have the muscle conditioning to where they can actually recover from these workouts so we can push them that much harder, right? Because, I mean, ultimately, the better conditioned they are, the better they are at executing these movements, the more muscle they're going to gain in that four days. Yeah. That's my objective. So, yeah, we you want to explain to listeners what is going to be a structure, you know, first workout of the day, you're going to be. Uh, right. So I think everyone's asking about that, too, because I was there teaching last year, and this is completely different content. So we're going to do a four-day structure. First day is going to be all seminar-based, and, and that can be anyone who wants to come to learn about muscle building. And you and I will teach everything we know in the eight hours that we're going to be teaching for that first day. No workouts involved. Day two, three, and four is going to be two workouts a day. First one's going to be very neurological based, right? So like teaching people how to contract muscle, how to ultimately optimize execution. And then we're going to come back and crush it in the afternoon with, with the Milo style giant set workouts. Because I mean, I think normally you give them two giant set workouts in a day. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. But you know, I mean, they need to survive and they're in for uh, hell. I mean, seriously, I I'm, right. this. I'm proud of this. Like I said, when you cross your foot in a gym, and you're there to train with me, I'm going to try to, you know, get the most out of you. So, yeah, but I never really prepare the people, but if you think that uh, we, we should give them like three weeks of preparation time, maybe it's not a bad idea. Well, I think it'll just allow them to take a little bit more of a, a harder workout. So it's funny because, Milos, everyone who comes to my workouts in you know my camps say they're the hardest workouts they've ever done. So we're kind of downplaying the morning workouts. It's like, oh, these will be Ben's workouts. These will be a little bit easier, really focused on execution. But when you focus on execution, you're actually doing things correctly. It's exponentially harder to the muscular system. So this is going to be very, very challenging in the morning. We'll do a lower volume, higher load, neurologically based workout. In the afternoon, we'll come back and apply those same execution principles onto these giant set style workouts. And really, ultimately, I mean, we've seen people gain tremendous amounts of muscle. I know at your camps back in the day, people were gaining, you know, huge amounts of muscle and you used to do five day camps. So it was, it was a lot. But that's definitely something that people will gain. I mean, you know, five to 10 pounds isn't unheard of in those days. Oh, yeah. In Australia, actually, there was a three-day camp in uh, Perth, two workouts a day, and average was eight pounds. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Some some guy would really have a twelve pounds in three days, and some would maybe just have a five. But yeah, there was maximizing back in the day. Actually, I prepared them also what to take intra workouts. So they did all the intra workout supplementation as they came. They were prepared. So yeah, and we'll also be supplying intra workout, post workout shakes, so everyone will have exactly what they need. They could just show up. And I think it's, you know, getting into content a little bit. What we're going to be teaching, obviously, you're going to be teaching all this stuff. Like I'm going to be picking your brain on all the contest secrets and getting in the condition that you're still in. Because like, you're how old are you now, Milos? I'm going to be 56 by the time I get to Dubai. I'm 55. If you're over six percent body fat, I'd be very surprised. Like, what's your guess? Yeah, about there. I'm I'm like 228. And yes, I actually posed for Andy and Rob and this is oh, like a separation. All this, I always have abs and all this, I have a quad separation. Yeah, my back is not, you know, super lean. So I might say it's over 6% now, but, uh, you know, from the front, you, you wouldn't be able to tell that. Yeah, which is just incredible, right? And I think all of our older listeners should should kind of take note. Is like it's still possible, man. And you train hard day in day out, no excuses around joint pain, and like you're getting old. Like, come on, that's it's just nonsense, right? You don't accept that standard for yourself, and I think that's so commendable. And there's so much to be learned there. And I'm going to pull all of that out of you in the camp as I, you know, pry into all of your secrets over the last thirty years. As far as what I'm going to be teaching, I'm going to be teaching people how to balance. Because I mean, actually, I'd love to ask you this question: Is are you of the belief that people should be training like this 365 days a year, knowing what you know now? I know you said that 10 years ago, you said, yes, they should be training like this because it's the hardest and it's what they should do. Do you still believe that? No, I mean, uh, especially now when you see bears and tears and it's like uh, so high in- intensity, you should uh, you know, make that periodization. And yeah, so I used to be against it. I always thought like every workout is a opportunity to just, you know, break your, your records and do better than uh, previous but your body is not designed to take that much you know it's, you need to take uh, breaks you know that's for sure well the beauty is we can quantify it now right meaning we can look at inflammatory markers and we can look at heart rate variability and those are two things i are going to explore pretty extensively in the camp so people are saying hey ben is this the same stuff i'm going to be teaching as i did last year and the answer is absolutely not so last year as i said i was teaching execution mastery and I'm really not going to dive into that all that much this year. The stuff that I want to focus on is all the other stuff. So looking at, you know, both of us will, will be teaching nutrition. I want to teach a little bit about heart rate variability and, and stress management and how to kind of tap into the autonomic nervous system and use it as your gateway to determine how hard you should be training that day, how much volume you should be using, how much nutrition you should be using based on feedback, right? So rather than guessing, which is what most people do, it's like, hey, Milos, you know, you're very recovered today. Push exponentially harder. Hey, you're not very recovered today maybe pull back you still work hard you still you do your giant set but maybe you're going to pull back and do like a little less volume so instead of you know four rounds of 18 exercises we'll just do two today or three right and just like be able to scale according to what your body's capable of because like you, know, you say injuries right well predictability for injuries is is pretty high like we can predict it when we see very low heart rate variability we can say, hey, this person is very likely to hurt themselves. So there's a couple things we can do, right? Hey, we have to train because we have the Olympia coming up. Okay, well, we're not going to pull back on our training. So then we put the calories higher, right? So most people run into problems with injuries when they're in a calorically depleted state and still train really, really hard when the heart rate variability is low. So if we see someone who has low heart rate variability, well, we go, okay, well, there's two things we can do here. We can pull back on your training or we can give you more calories, well, pulling back on the training is not an option, so I'm going to push the calories back up. You know, we can literally teach people to play with these different variables and give them different intervention strategies to allow them to go back in the gym and do those hard workouts faster. And that's what I want to focus on. So it's the mindset piece. It's the autonomic nervous system, heart rate variability. It's sleep, teaching you some amazing hacks for optimizing sleep. And, you know, everything else that ultimately goes into building a great physique and living healthy, because, I mean, you're you're looking incredible and you're still healthy at 56. And, you know, if you're going to keep going well into your 90s and and probably into triple digits, man, and and I hope that I can join you. Yeah, You know, when I turned pro, my first pro show, it was a San Jose pre-invitational and the guy next to me was Albert Beckles. Yeah. He was 61 years old. Okay. A uh, week after the San Jose, he won the Niagara Falls for Invitational. So, you know, 61 years old, beating all of us. And I uh, mean, he beat Sonny Schmidt, Ron Love, and, you know, some great guys. You know, so look at Dexter. I mean, yeah, they say age is just a number. If you really take everything 
in consideration, you live a healthy lifestyle. And one thing that you said, if you're not guessing, if you know, it's a big difference between, okay, I know or I guess. I, I'll guess I'm going to, this is good. And No, no. If you analyze everything and monitor everything, you know, keep the notes, watch your body, you're going to pretty much realize what is optimal for you and what is not enough and what is, you know, way too much. Speaking of that, I'm holding my Elite HRV device. I bought it after <laughs> I heard from you. you know, so I got one. So I can wait actually to learn from you about heart rate variability. You know, so this is one thing I'm excited. Yeah, I think looking at contest prep, I mean, you've done so many contest prep in your life and, and I've trained a lot of people for contests and you're still training a lot of people for contests and, and giving people kind of a framework on, you know, whether you're getting ready for a contest or just want to transform your body, like where do you start, you know, and then learning how to make changes and what are kind of the cues and triggers to make changes. These are all things that we'll teach at these camps. If anyone wants to join us at the camps, you guys, so you can't do the Dubai Muscle Camp or you can, but I can't give you a discount for it. DubaiMuscleCamp.com. Go there, sign up. If you're coming to Australia or Bali, I'm going to give you the code MILOS, M-I-L-O-S. You can put that code in and that's going to give you $200 off. And anyone who uses that code will also get the three-week workout plan from us, whether or not you use all three weeks or not. We'll send you that directly via email. M-I-L-O-S is your code, $200 off, and you will get the three-week workout. That's only if you come to all four days. I can't unfortunately do that if you just come to one day. But I hope to see everybody there. And man, dude, I'm so excited to spend four weeks traveling with you, training like a beast again. So, I mean, my training has not been anywhere near what it was back in the day. So I'm literally going to start turning it up now. And hopefully I can have a decent transformation while I'm with you. You, you, are, you are young and strong, you know, so like now you're going to expose me to trouble. So I have to you know, up my game now. <laughs> I have it three weeks. Man, either way, it's going to be a load of fun, and we're going to teach a lot of people a lot of cool stuff. And I'm sure we, I'm going to learn a lot from you again, buddy. So I'm super grateful for your time today and can't wait for our first camp in Dubai, which is January 28th, 29th, and 30th for anybody that wants to join us there. All right. Oh, by the way, I've seen that squat. You, you did four plates like nothing. Don't expect me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> The, the problem was that was one set and it was like six reps, man. When, I, when we're doing that for, you know, 30 giant sets, I think that's where the problem starts to come yeah. in. <laughs> All right. All right, buddy. Awesome stuff, man, dude. So grateful for you. Where can people find more from you, Milos? If they want to work with you coaching wise or if they want to get in touch with you on the internet. Yeah, the, the best way is social media, my Instagram at Milos Arcev, M-I-L-O-S-S-A-R-C-E-V. Very few people can actually pronounce my name. You are, you are one of the few that say it correctly. But the last name is always misspelled, you know, so it's S-A-R-C-E-V. And I have a Facebook. And then, and then of course, my emails would be just milos.sharchev at iCloud.com. That would be the best. Perfect, man. I hope everybody reaches out to Milos if you ever want to have a competition in mind because he is literally the king and the mind is the nickname. Thank you, Milos, for joining me and for your time. Thank you. As a wrap, ladies and gents, I hope you love this podcast with one of my heroes and mentors, Mila Sharchev. As you can hear, his commitment to this is world-class, and there's something to be garnered there, regardless if you're aspiring to be a bodybuilder or not. If you're someone who wants to be great in anything, this focused persistence, almost savage-like focus is absolutely necessary. And I had a conversation with one of my friends this morning about how neurotic how obsessed I was as a bodybuilder. That, and that's literally what allowed me to get to the heights that I did. There was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to the Mr. Olympia. From the time I was 17 years old, I was not training to build my chest. I was not training to win a bodybuilding show. I was not training to be the best in my gym. I was training to compete in the Mr. Olympia contest. And taking that framing from such a young age allowed me to, one, eliminate all the extraneous noise and all the distractions that exist in everyone's life and really focus on going deep on, you know, this 17-year-old boy who had really no muscle training like he's getting ready for the Mr. Olympia contest puts a whole new level of perspective on every single set, on every single meal, on every single minute of your day. And was that a lot of pressure on myself? Yes, but it also allowed me to really to focus and very clearly decide that I don't want to do other things and you know, ultimately make decisions in a way that was pretty clear. And yes, I cut away a lot of things. I sacrificed a lot from other people's perspective, but there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to make it where I did. And because that was the only goal. 
There was no, oh, I want to compete. There was no, oh, I want to win the national championship. That wasn't even on my mind. That was a foregone conclusion. The goal was I'm going to be on the Mr. Olympia stage. And if you guys are setting the goal in life in anything, whether it be to build a business or ultimately become a great meditator, like don't set a goal to just be good. Good is the enemy of great. And we know that. And if we can set a goal to be world class or get to the final destination, set a goal that's so big that it excites you to get out of bed every morning. How is I able to get out of bed every day at 4.30 a.m., go to the gym two to three times every day in a caloric deficit? Well, because it was so powerful for me to think about walking every day on that Olympia stage. And I would literally envision myself walking up those stairs to walk on stage and hear the crowd go wild and hear my name being announced over the PA system. I could hear it. I could see it. I could smell it. And if you can't do that, the likelihood of it coming true becomes less and less and less. So I suggest if any of you have a goal, if it's literally anything, spend some time every day thinking about that goal, dreaming about that goal, writing down that goal. And it should be something that's so exciting to you that it's easy to get out of bed. There's no such thing as a snooze button. It doesn't even exist. I jump out of bed every morning when it's time to go do cardio. I jump out of bed to go have a meal or go to enjoy my workouts because I know that's the end result and that excites me. And if your goal doesn't excite you, you're on the wrong path. You've chosen the wrong goal. So I suggest re-exploring that goal. I hope you guys absolutely love this conversation. If you did, I'm so grateful for your reviews. I get so much awesome feedback on social media, guys. Thank you. Please leave us a review. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. Share it with at least one person you know so we can perpetuate this mission to live your greatest life in a body you love and help others to grow and flourish and make this world a better place. I love you all. Have a great day. Talk soon. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.